Hi everyone, I'm Sin from Art Science Museum in Singapore. Thank you for joining us this evening at Art Science at Home in our concluding talk for Climate Conversations. Since October last year, Climate Conversations have been unfolding alongside our Planet of Plastic exhibition. The series dialogues with scientists and artists who are tackling complex environmental issues in their work to bring to you some of the most pressing profound stories from the front lines of conservation and climate innovation. Planet of Plastic marks the first show to launch at Art Science Museum since we reopened after Singapore's circuit breaker. It tells the story of plastic from its invention just over a century ago to the environmental impact brought about by its mass consumption. Featuring 70 powerful images displayed in six sections, the exhibition highlights the fragility of our natural environment and how it is impacted by the plastic waste crisis. Each year, 9 million tons of plastic ends up in the ocean. If unretrieved, it is estimated that it will remain there for centuries, destroying the delicate ecosystems critical to not just our planet's health, but our survival. There is an ecosystem in every backyard and something that can be done anywhere, and it is exactly what Planet of Plastic is trying to address. The exhibition not only aims to raise awareness of society's dependence on plastic by visually depicting the crisis, it also highlights innovative individuals and communities who are working on solutions to this urgent problem. Since we launched Climate Conversations last October, we have heard from Director of International Exhibitions at National Geographic Society, Cynthia Dumbia, who spoke about how National Geographic's multi-year Planet of Plastic initiative harnesses storytelling to tackle the global plastic waste crisis and effect meaningful change. Dr. Intan Suchi Norhati, who is Senior Researcher at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences Research Center for Oceanography, highlighted issues in plastics management and shared her recent research work started in lockdown that looks at the rising tide of pandemic-driven plastic waste. Photographer Mandy Barker took us through the journey of how she has been working alongside marine scientists to transform data on ocean plastics into collages of pollution. And conservation scientist Professor Colin Pin, who is director of the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at National University of Singapore, spoke about how a better understanding of the potential and limits of nature-based climate solutions is needed to help inform climate policy and investment decisions. In the coda to climate conversations today, we are delighted to be joined by ecologist and president of Nature Society Singapore, Dr. Sean Lam. Dr. Lam's work on forest fragmentation and regeneration has aided the protection of Singapore's forests and formed the basis of public outreach of our national heritage. He currently lectures at the Asian School of the Environment at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and does work in conservation biology and environmental education interacting with a wide range of people from fellow researchers and naturalists to educators and students. His leadership of the Nature Society since 2008 has been associated with many wonderful conservation and outreach initiatives that aim to make nature part of the Singaporean identity. Dr. Lam's talk today will center around efforts by Nature Society Singapore on marine conservation and discuss how we can play a role in protecting our marine environments and biodiversity. We're live streaming on Facebook and YouTube and would love to hear from you throughout the session. And we will be starting with a the talk, then moving into a Q&A with Dr. Lam, where we will take questions from the floor. So please do share your thoughts and questions with us in the live chats. It gives me great pleasure now welcoming Dr. Sean Lam to today's program. Uh, hi, Sin. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, yes, I, I, I must confess, I study forests. So then the question might be, well, what is a forest person uh, doing speaking about the marine environment? Well, I hope that I still have something to say. And it's really not what, what I have to say, but what colleagues of mine and friends have done over the years that I'm, I'm very honored to, to present. Uh, before I start, I also want to thank Rachel and Ira and Yusin from the Art Science Museum for inviting me and allowing me to uh, spend this hour with, with all of you this evening. I'm just going to go straight into uh, showing some slides, if, if, if I may. 
and uh, that that's I don't want to share that. Uh, let, Okay, here we go. So um, I would like to now show, here we go. So this is, um, I hope not to go for very long so that we have more time for question and answer. And I really, I think the, the, the key to an enjoyable evening will be not so much what I have to say, but what you have to share and ask and challenge and, um, and not just me, but each other and, and sin of course as well. I am a member of the Nature Society Singapore. It's a non-government organization. It's been around. We trace our history to 1940, where we were a part of the what was called the Malayan Nature Society, and in 1954 uh, became a Singapore branch of that society. And in 1991, um, it became the Nature Society Singapore. And some of the things that we've done over the years I'd like to share with you. Starting with, I just wanna introduce some issues of marine life and then we'll talk about later marine debris and marine conservation. Um, in, in particular, in the context of what this civil society group, the Nature Society has done over the years, my colleagues and friends and mentors. What are some of the marine conservation efforts um, that not only we, but Singapore in general have, have pursued over the past few years? And in the again, in, with the threat, uh, not just uh, uh, past, but continuing threat of uh, marine pollution, climate change, and so on to life in our precious seas. And finally, I think it's not um, right just to leave this conversation a biological one or nature conservation one, but I think nature conservation includes us. And so um, everything that we are, um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and hopefully it'll make some sense later. Um, this frayed yellow red book actually is the notes of minutes uh, for the Malayan Nature Society Singapore branch. And this is the opening page, 1954. And you can see in that very, very, very uh, deliberate uh, script there, you can see the initial committee for this society, the Singapore branch, 1954, not very long after World War II. The chairman is a man named Mr. Michael Tweedy, secretary, a person named Ivan Enoch, and the committee includes people such as Persklov, uh, Dennis Perchon, and Lokuan To. Uh, some of you in the audience may, may know these names, but not everyone. I just say that J.W. Persklov at the time was the uh, garden, uh, director of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Dennis Perchon was a professor of zoology at the very, very new University of Malaya. And Ivan Enoch was a lecturer there. But two people in particular, Michael Tweedy, is one of the greatest naturalists ever to work in Singapore. And he was the director of the, he directed the Raffles Museum, which is the forerunner to the Singapore National Museum. That, that's the building, those of you who know the National Museum of Singapore, that was once called the Raffles Museum. And Tweedy, a renowned zoologist, was its director. The secretary of the society at that time was Datuk Lok Wan To, who was a, who was a Renaissance uh, person. He, he was a businessman. Uh, a scholar, a uh, fantastic photographer and ornithologist, and a philanthropist. Um, big shoes to fill for anybody who uh, assumes those positions, uh, uh, especially, you know, the people like me. I just want to walk you through a history of some of the things that the Nature Society have done over the years, beginning in the 1960s. So marine conservation and marine outreach uh, has been really part of our one of the core things in the organization from the very start. So as you can see there, we, we even had members going up the east coast of, of Malaysia um, in, in cooperating on a turtle conservation project. And I think in the upper right hand corner, you see a giant leatherback turtle. Sadly, these, these gentle, uh, marvelous, miraculous even, and ancient uh, giants are in real trouble. Uh, we recognized this back in the 1960s. Uh, fast forwarding a bit to the 1980s, and uh, 
this man in the center, Richard Hale, here he is uh, standing next to then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong. Uh, Richard chanced upon this area of fish ponds uh, on the northwestern coast of Singapore and found that it was it was the staging ground for many, many migratory shorebirds. And it turns out that this place is called Sungai Bulo, and a proposal was put forth by the Conservation Committee of the Bird of the Nature Society at that time. And um, the Ministry of National Development of Singapore accepted that proposal and took on this project and really ran with it. And today we have the Sungai Bulo Wetlands Reserve as a result. And of course, many other conservation proposals followed, some of them for marine or estuarine areas, such as some which were successful, like the Sungai Kate Bongsu, which is in Yishun, just recently named as a nature park. Others were not. This is the upper right-hand corner. This is the Sonoko. It was also a wetlands with lots of migratory birds. Unfortunately, it is not a nature area um, today. But um, this, again, this, this work has been part of the Nature Society, both in Singapore and also our sister groups in Malaysia uh, since the very beginning. In the 1990s, this woman, uh, the late Helen Newman, who was really a pioneer in marine conservation in Singapore, uh, got a number of her marine conservation group members and colleagues excited about reef rescue. The, the reason why uh, this was necessary was because Singapore, as you know, um, was originally 540 square kilometers. Today we're at 720 square kilometers, so that 180 square kilometers came out of, well, was reclamation of the of, of the coast of Singapore. And as these areas were reclaimed, uh, some of these were coral habitats. And so Helen Newman initiated a reef rescue project. Uh, some of it successful, some of it uh, with uh, low, sur uh, low survivorship, but the idea really was don't just let the coral habitats be covered up, try to do something about it. And they actually did a, uh, the first coral transplant scheme in Singapore. Today it's routinely done uh, by government agencies as well as um, uh, professional environment consultancy companies. Um, but I'm very proud that one of my uh, mentors, Helen Newman, was involved in some of these initial attempts at reef rescue. We, have, of course, have a very rich marine heritage in Singapore and the surrounding waters. Here in Singapore, there's over 200 species of hard coral, which is a staggering percentage of the world's hard corals, something like 20 to 30 percent, if I'm not mistaken, considering how small Singapore is and how vast the oceans are that these waters are so rich in coral um, that a significant percentage of the world's hard corals can be found in a small and highly industrialized uh, city-state like Singapore. And of course, in these reefs, if you go down there, um, if you get close enough or you're lucky and get a clear day, there's, there's so much to see. 120 species of reef fish, for example, you know, um, uh, mollusks, sponges, crustacea, you name it. This is all part of our heritage. Seagrasses, over two-thirds, about two-thirds of the seagrasses found in the Indo-Pacific region can be found uh, in Singapore waters. In absolutely incredible. Now, there's a few uh, more recent efforts that the society has been involved in but cannot take full credit for. We can take credit for, thanks to the work of member Kate Toma, who was a high school, uh, middle school biology teacher. Uh, she signed the Nature Society up for what was called the International Coastal Cleanup, which is an international effort every year on a given day to go out to the coasts and not only pick up marine debris, but also to catalog it and to try to understand what is it that's polluting our waters in terms of trash. The coastal cleanup eventually got passed to this man, um, my colleague and, and uh, somebody I greatly admire, Mr. N. Sivasoti, who's a senior lecturer at NUS, but that's not saying enough. He's an inspiration to th thousands who've had the privilege of learning from him. And Siva, uh, for the past 25 years, has been coordinating the international coastal cleanup for all of Singapore. And the Nature Society take part. 
Now, he, he, I just, you know, so this is what they do. They do these uh, surveys, collect the trash, weigh it, and and then categorize it according, you know, what, what type of debris it was. So this is the 2005 data. And already, you know, there are 2,000 volunteers, and they picked up seven tons of trash from the beaches on a single day. Uh, most of that was styrofoam pieces, but there were, I mean, can you imagine straws, stirrers, cigarettes, these small little items uh, comprised over 10% of all that waste? And the kinds of things that you see, absolutely unbelievable. So there's a close up. You, you just have a quick look from beverage bottles to plastic cups, plastic sheeting, food wrappers, styrofoam. Um, yeah, a, a kind of a stain on our. Um, reputation as a clean and green. But then again, it's the marine realm. And so much of that trash isn't necessarily domestically generated, but it just, um, the sea connects us and it also brings our rubbish to other places and rubbish from other places to us. Um, this is the 2017 data for single site uh, done by the Nature Society. This is a crunchy bund mangroves. And our volunteers on that day uh, collected 280 kilograms of trash. But this is 12 years later. As you can see, plastic, plastic bags and those kinds of things become were the most common. So over the years, we've seen the composition of, of marine trash change, and it's been documented thanks to projects like this, the International Coastal Cleanup, for which Mr. Siva Soti is the Singapore coordinator. Here's a happy group. They're smiling. It it it, and they look clean, uh, but I see piles of trash. So either they changed or they're just very meticulous at, at picking up marine debris. They're from Anglo-Chinese ju junior school. Here's some of the things that you see washed up on the shores. Again, you think, man, that's a lot of, and you go back the next year and there's going to be the same amount of trash. In fact, go back the next month, there's going to be a lot of trash already. So, you know, cleaning up Trash from the beach is great, but then how do we stop the trash from getting in there in the first place? One of the perennial challenges that face marine conservationists and anybody really who cares about the oceans. Um, here's some pictures on a night patrol for sea turtles taken by Lisa Lim. And this marine trash on our uh, shores, on, this is the East Coast, I believe, this actually impedes the progress of turtles who wish to come up and lay eggs. So it has knock-on effects. It's not just unsightly. It, it actually poses a threat to endangered wildlife. Here's, here's some more. Look at that big piece of uh, flotsam styrofoam. Here's another one from Lisa Lim. This is from the shores of Pula Ubin. So basically anywhere where there's a shore, the sea will bring the trash to us. And that's what they cleaned up on this particular day at Pula Ubin, just, ton, just bags and bags of trash. And, you know, they're still smiling, maybe smiling from a um, job well done, but maybe inside kind of crying because, you know, how, how, how can we con with, with clear conscience uh, throw rubbish, which eventually ends up in our seas, polluting our waters. There's another thing that we do. This is something called the Horseshoe Crab Rescue and Research. It's one of the flagship activities of the Nature Society. It's been carrying on since about 2008 when some bird watchers who went to actually see marine uh, shorebirds noticed that there were these nets, ghost nets that drifted onto shore. And in those nets were caught lots of uh, marine life, particularly horseshoe crabs. They get a lot of spikes and joints and these get caught up, hopelessly tangled in the nets. Let me show you a few photos. There is a flower crab, Portunus, in the lower right-hand corner. There's the net, and here's a horseshoe crab. And it's not just the, the, the lone, oh, there's two horseshoe crabs, actually, but it's not just the lone horseshoe crab like, like these. And they have no, no chance, really, when um, they'll eventually, um, either they can't move and they'll get um, overheated, dried up, or they'll get, um, they'll, They'll be just as terrible. Look at this one. Just, um, I don't know what the plural for horseshoe crabs is, but um, there's a lot of them there. But uh, these volunteers have, since 2008, been going down to extricate horseshoe crabs from these nets, freeing them. They're, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years, and yet um, uh, modern invention like plastic 
uh, uh, seems to be one of their biggest threats. Here, here's another, here's a, a group of volunteers trying to rescue these horseshoe crabs. Um, but having said that, you know, it's not just rescuing crabs, it's studying them too. And our volunteers have been able to find many wondrous things about them. How long they live, how quickly do they grow? What's the ratio of males to females? How far do they move? We did a tracking study of horseshoe crabs to understand their movement. And this is the Kranji beach. It's, it's got one of the highest documented concentrations of horseshoe crabs uh, in the world. Thanks to my colleague, Vina Dharmaraja, who is now the regional director at BirdLife International. He wrote um, some, uh, some policy documents which were taken up by the International Uni Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, a uh, resolution to look after and better protect Asian horseshoe crabs. Of course, there's a, also ghost nets do all kinds of damage, not just to horseshoe crabs, uh, marine turtles, uh, marine mammals, fish, one of the ways, of course, to try to better conserve and manage the oceans is to put into place some conservation, solid conservation policy and enforcement. And to that effect, marine conservationists in Singapore over the years have been putting together what's called the, the Blue Plan. This is a 2009 version where some of my colleagues um, put together uh, proposals for improved marine conservation in Singapore. And it, again, it was a proposal by civil society for the protection of Singapore's marine heritage. And some good things have come out of this, such as funding for a, a, what's called a mega marine survey to better document what's in our waters, greater interest in marine life. And many young conservationists have stepped up and really lead Singapore's efforts. And many of these young conservationists, uh, led by Zihan Jafar, uh, lecturer at the National University of Singapore, uh, updated the Blue Plan. Uh, this is the 2018 Singapore Blue Plan, and it's it's found traction. I'm, I'm very happy to say. Now I want to briefly shift because what I want to say is that it's important to have legislation. It's good to have enforcement, fines for littering. Uh, traps in our waterways to, to, to catch debris before they go out to the ocean. And we can have litter bins uh, more widely distributed, for example, and teach people to use them or to, or to make that part of our uh, culture. But these are, these are rules, these are regulations, and they are an important part of marine conservation. And I think in this climate conversation series, many of the people have been talking about enforcement, better policy, integration between policy, management, and, and so on. But I, I think the biggest transformation has to be inside uh, each and every one of us. And I, I like to, as an example, bring up uh, some things that I learned growing up. I grew up in the Hawaiian Islands, and I'm not, I would not ever claim that Hawaiians do a better job of looking after the marine life um, than other people in people in other places, including Singapore. But I can say that there are a few lessons, perhaps for for all of us, from people who uh, cultures that are island cultures. And Singapore is an island culture as well. Uh, so if you think about Hawaii, you, you really just think about these uh, sort of places like Waikiki, which is a tourist haven, but and you go to a place like Hawaii or Honolulu, and many towns start with the word W or W A I. I think I gave it away. W A I Y means water. So already in the place names, you see that there's there's this strong association with freshwater, Y, or seawater, which is Kai. And this is the traditional land use system. It's called a, it's, a, it's a mouthful. It's called a ahupua'a, but it starts in the mountain. And it's integrated from mountain all the way to sea. It includes the stream. It includes taro fields. It includes forests and aquaculture at the coast, fish ponds. And these are all integrated. At what, hap what good management upstream leads to more productivity and, and resources that people can depend on downstream and in, at the coast. And this is the traditional land use system. Again, it's integrated, it's holistic, and it allowed 
these islands to even with this ancient technology uh, to support a very large population. Um, so here are upland uh, taro fields, for example, what, what we, in Singapore we call yam, colocasia. And then at the coast, there'd be these fish ponds. And these were not uh, salmon or other carnivorous fish, but they were actually cultivating um, more sustainable type fish that eat algae and you know, herbivorous fish. Um, and uh, there are chants and legends about the sea. Here's what a favorite song of mine, one of my favorites for a, a legendary uh, Hawaiian teacher and, and tr keeper of traditions named Auntie Edith Kanakaole. Here's one of the songs that she wrote. It's called Ka'uluvehi o Kekai. It just means the green, the verdant sea. And um, it's a song basically about seaweed. But if you look at the words, it's, it, it, it's really, when, when these words are sung, the, it's, it's, it comes from inside. And, and you can see that the sea, Moana, is a, a big part of, of, of who these people are, who my ancestors are and my cousins are. And um, our lives revolve around the sea, our recreation, our happy moments, sad moments, our food. And so I think if you were to peer down into, if you, if you had a microscope, I don't know if you could do this and, and, and zoom into the heart of an islander, I think you'd see the ocean in there somewhere. I mean, it probably flows, courses through their veins as well. And so this ocean is not just the place you go to get things. The ocean is something that you respect. It's something that gives, it can, can, can be productive and gives life, but it can be dangerous. So you have to be wary of that too. Um, now, this, what's this house? There's, there's a house here on the corner of Bell Street. That's where my aunt lives. This is where my grandmother was before her. And that, that house uh, was actually right across from the beach. So here's the house. And so this is my playground uh, for my childhood every weekend. You go out to the sea and you realize what a wonderful thing it is. It's, it's comforting. It's soothing. It's beautiful. It's refreshing. It's, it's what all your ancestral songs uh, celebrate and sing about places are named after water and the ocean and uh, so again the ocean is an inextricable part of of the culture of island people not just hawaiian people but island people everywhere and and here's the ahupua of waimanalo where my grandmother grew up from the mountain to the sea all of this would have been managed as one integrated unit so even before people knew about sustainable development, I think people were doing it all over the world. But Singapore has a marine heritage too. And it's not just biology for scientists. So let me give you a couple of examples. So this is, this is called Teluk Kurau Road. It's on the East Coast and you know, it's got some, some pretty trendy eateries and so on. And there's Teluk Kurau Road. This is the parade housing estate and this uh, across this junction is Teluk Kurau Road with Marine Parade Road. Everything where this bus is beyond was once the sea. And that's all reclaimed land. And I'm not for a moment saying we cannot reclaim land, but um, there is a strong marine heritage here, which is which could be erased if we're not careful enough. And so I think even with with land reclamation, it's important to try to retain that connection somehow. Even the name Teluk Kurau. Uh, has a link to the sea. It, it says here on the National Library webpage, resource page, that uh, Teluk Kurau is Malay for Mango Fish Bay. So I scratched my head when I saw that. Because, what, what's a mango fish? And I asked people, they, they're not sure what mango fish is, but it's clear that who wrote the, whoever wrote this article really is not familiar with the sea or with uh, local language or na place names because Kurau is the Malay word, not for mango fish, but for this thing, the thread fin, what people in dialect call mulhu, it's, it's the, it's, yeah, it's a fish, a, a, de a prized delicacy fish. Unfortunately, it's on the avoid list of the WWF Sustainable Seafood Guide. But even our place names are named after turtles or marine plants or fish, not just an exotic, Bora Bora or Tahiti, but, but in Singapore. And we've lost this link, uh, sadly, I think. And it's time to 
restore that link. It's, it's time to make the sea, in order to conserve it, yes, we need regulations. Yes, we need to prevent people from littering. Yes, we need to have all the technical know-how we need to sort of clean up the oceans and people to pick up the trash. But actually, we have to take this marine heritage, and not just for biologists to study, but for everyone to celebrate together. This is our shared heritage. It's got to be, if it's not embedded in our hearts and in our souls, I'm not sure if the sea really has that much of a chance. We go to fish markets. It's part of our culture. We don't even know the names of all the fish. Let's learn those names. Let's learn about these fish. If we care about seafood, which we do in Asia, I think that means we should, be, we should care about whether there's enough in the future so that future generations can enjoy it as much as we do. So I think there's a disconnect between exploiting marine resources and using the ocean for recreation and how the sea actually brings life, not just to marine organisms, um, but to us as well. Uh, the sea is something, you know, every time you take students or anybody goes to the sea, it's, it's, it's a place of wonder. Let's get more people to make this uh, part of our heritage hundreds of thousands of people in coastal cities around in tropical Asia and elsewhere, millions, actually hundreds of millions, see the ocean every day. But for those millions and millions of people, is does the ocean flow through people's veins? Can you look peer into the heart of a Singaporean or uh, any anyone else from our region and actually find find the ocean somewhere? Maybe for some people, but I think many, many more lives would be enriched if we accepted this as an important part of our heritage. I just wanna thank a few people. These are friends who kindly provided some photos, Kwake Yao, Lester Tan, Lisa Lim, they're from the Marine Conservation Group of the Nature Society, Kerry Pereira, our outreach officer, Leon Kwok Peng, uh, my guru, and a uh, dear friend, uh, former vice president of Nature Society, uh, guided me and has been my mentor for as long as I've been a member of the Nature Society. And I want to reserve the biggest thanks to two mentors who should be really national treasures, not of Singapore only, but of the region. The first is Professor Chao Lok Ming, longtime professor, now Professor Emeritus at the National University of Singapore. He's the father of reef studies. And out of his lab have come all the leaders for marine science and conservation, uh, many of them uh, in Singapore and in the region. And my special thanks also to Professor Leo Tan, who has tirelessly championed the ocean. Um, uh, yeah, I think he doesn't have blood. I think it's salt water in his veins. And, and, and Professor Tan, again, has inspired uh, countless people, uh, not just me, With, without people like Professor Chow or Professor Tan, uh, imagine what the state of marine biology would be. And the, the idea is this, why wait for just uh, Providence to deliver to us a Chow Luk Ming or a Leo Tan? Why don't we work to actively encourage more people to be like this, that one of these students uh, will be the next great marine conservationist. And in fact, let's not even hope that we get more marine conservationists. I think if we all treasure the sea, feel a sense of wonder every time we visit it, have a deep reverence for the marine life that occupies us, occupies it and gives us life, um, maybe we won't need marine conservationists because we will take care of the sea, not because uh, it's our, it, it, it's, it's the policy, but simply because it's the right thing to do. Most of all, I wanna thank all of you who've get, given up a uh, precious hour um, to spend time with us in the Art Science Museum Climate Conversation Series. And once again, thank you, Rachel, Lyra, and Sin. And at this point, I will stop sharing and I'd love to get your thoughts on how we can better take care of this precious marine heritage of ours and more generally uh, the environment. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Sean. There's been so much wonderful feedback and comments coming through more than questions, um, but perhaps we can get to a couple of them. Um, and everyone else who's listening in, we're now going to a Q&A with Dr. Lam. So if you have any comments or thoughts or questions, please continue to share them with us in the live chats, whether you are joining from Facebook or from YouTube, and we will try to get to all of them. Um, Sean, there's a question from April Lim. Um, was talking about the sort of um, beautiful personal anecdotes that you were sharing earlier. I'm um, just referencing the Hawaiian traditional way of life. Um, she's asking in order to progress, do we as mega urbanites have to paradoxically go back to basics, for instance, um, being closer to beaches and nature in order to be able to appreciate our her natural heritage more? Uh, uh, possibly. But but maybe in a in a in, in a new way. But even if you think about it, just I, I mean I've been in Singapore for the past thirty years. When I came came, even just a few years earlier, there were still a few fishing villages left. There was a there was a village on the island of of Pulau Sakeng, which is now part of the Pulau Semakau, um, you know, landfill area. And there, uh, these people, Orang Laut, I, I believe. Who, who, for as long as anyone knows, have 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 had a very strong and intimate connection with the sea. There was, until not too long ago, a group of people known as the Orang Salitar. They were part, uh, it, and and not even indigenous people. If you talk to anybody who lived in a coastal area, Algang, Pasipanjang, East Coast, uh, the sea was part of our lives, and we've managed to lose that connection. In, in just a, a generation, but I feel we can get that connection back. It, it might be partly going back to basics, but you know, if you just watch, you know, we just need to take time, I believe, uh, from these crazy schedules that we have, go down to the sea and that the magic of the ocean, I really believe will transform each and every one of us. It has the power to do that. So we have a question from Glenn as well. And Glenn is asking, how can we as Singaporeans use or implement the methods that the Hawaiians use um, due to our smaller land mass? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sin. Uh, and, and Glenn, of course. Uh, there are certain things, of course, that we geographically we're, we're limited. We, we don't have tall mountains and, and, and big streams. And, and of course, owing to other existential uh, challenges such as how do we get fresh water? We we uh, we we have dammed many of our estuaries to create uh, vital freshwater reservoirs. Um, but but at the same time, I do think we, we can take some lessons from coastal peoples, and so there can be recreation at the sea. But maybe some of this recreation need not be just adventure type recreation. Maybe it could be a kind of a more quiet contemplative recreation. And I do realize that fish ponds, traditional fish ponds, maybe can't feed the multitudes here in Singapore. And that's why we have high tech uh, aquaculture, but we can, but we still need, I think that connection and maybe we can have sort of demonstration areas where you can uh, look at marine life. And I, well, of course we have places like the Sisters Island Marine Park that N Parks have, have been promoting and doing a fantastic job of doing. Uh, but I think even on the main island we have a few uh, coastal parks west coast park east coast park i see no reason why uh, um, a kind of marine lifestyle uh, and traditions uh, could not be re re um, replicated or, or reinvented another thing we have uh, traditional uh, boats uh, you know, sampans and, and all these other marine craft, wonderful, amazing things. So imagine if we, instead of having a kayak club, we had sampan riding and rafting as a, a school activity. It's so much fun. And you see how clever our ancestors were in, in, in crafting these fairly simple looking craft, which are anything but simple. Uh, and great coordination too, to try to stand and balance on one of these things as well. So yeah, I, I, I think why not? Let's let's reinvent this for the 21st century, and 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 at the same time, um, build our links with uh, the sea and with our ancestors also. 
We have a couple of questions coming in asking about um, young people specifically and how we can create stewards of the planet leading to sustainable future for all. Um, so the first question from Chan Fang Yi, um, she wonders um, whether you might have any thoughts on how important it is that we start a conservation or environmental curriculum of sorts in our schools? And do you think that's something that could be really built into the curriculum in better ways? Thank you. From what I understand from many of my educator friends, and uh, both at the schools and also at the Ministry of Education, there is this increased um, emphasis now on actually getting people to go to nature areas. It can be the forest, it can be the mangrove to the seas, uh, both in a formal curriculum sense and also in a kind of informal co-curricular sense. And that someplace like the outward bound, which maybe was accessible only to a, a selected group of people in the past will be accessible to more students. So I think we're starting to see these kinds of activities, but it, you know, it need not be link, um, um, restricted to schools. I think, and again, it's 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 a it's not easy. People work hard. They're, they're trying to, you know, make ends meet, and so maybe a lot of parents don't have time to take their kids to the beach. But if there's somehow some some avenue for informal um, visits to the sea too, that we take some of the load off the schools and and make it more of a society wide thing, I think that that can complement the formal. Uh, education as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Chun Xian also shared something quite similar. Um, he mentioned, or he or she mentioned that MOE has recently announced that um, they'll be incorporating sustainability into the school curriculum through an eco-stewardship program. And um, some questions about whether this link to national her natural heritage can be built are more meaningful into the curriculum. I hope that kind of answers your question. And Chun Xian was also asking whether we could see your cat. Maybe we might get to that. <laughs> Yeah, she was she was here. Uh, she, she, she got fed up with me. You know, there's another thing that we we do we do well um, in, in an informal way. But I I I do remember, you know, growing up, we have a term called kupuna. This is for the, the elders, and this just doesn't mean old people. When you say kupuna, these these people are your kupuna. It just doesn't mean auntie uncle. It 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 it, it that term also carries connotes a sense of reverence. So you listen to your kupuna, not because they're older, but because they have something wise to share with you. And I think in our, you know, I mean, this, I'm all for this youth and the power and energy and creative energy of, of young people, but let's not forget the older people. They have some incredible things to share with us. And how do we bridge that divide? And I think the ocean or nature in general is a great way to bring communities together, to bring generations together. You know, how, how do different cultures uh, relate to the sea? And in Singapore, we're so cosmopolitan. Europeans, uh, North Americans, Australians, it, people from India, China, Singapore, different ethnicities. Let's have these conversations about the ocean, our traditions, our stories, our songs, our legends, and get a, you know, all this knowledge is here, this love for the sea. Let's share it and spread it. We might have a couple of your former students listening in, Dr. Lam. So um, Faisal Hashim um, said he really appreciated the beautiful sharing and he really missed your NIE lectures. Um, but also a question from him asking, how do we more broadly reach out to young people and children and better engage them in marine conservation? Um, the, the sentiment is that he feels like the younger generation and even for, you know, the, the broader demographic, we are kind of taking care, things for granted and not appreciating the history behind the seas that surround Singapore. Um, Faisal, thanks for the question and th thanks for uh, tuning in, joining us. I, I think, you know, Sin, there's a couple of, it, it works at a couple of levels. So there will always be people like my colleagues, like many of my students, people like Siva Soti and his students who naturally gravitate to the sea because they just love marine life. You know, it's just, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. They want to study it. Uh, they want to make it their life's work to save it. And so there's always going to be this group, but, 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 but what percentage of, of us 
are, are biodiversity experts? And, and how do then we, how, how do we reach out to everybody else? Not to, not to change people's minds or their values, just get them to the ocean. I think the ocean will, will do that let it wash over you, wash through you, you know, completely change the way we relate to it. I think you'll see, uh, and it's got to be across sectors. So the food industry, I think can play a big part and not just by saying we have sustainable fish, but how, uh, let's make that connection. Here's food, here's a fish, here's the, the marine world. Here's other cultures that use this fish. I think our finance sector, our construction industry. I think if we, we, we need to make this holistic, everybody has to play a part. And starting with, of course, we need more scientists like uh, the Leo Tans and Chao Mings of the world. But, but I think, um, imagine if we had 5.5 million people who every time we looked at the ocean, we would maybe stop for a second and just appreciate how amazing it was. And, and that it brings life to us is not just for jet skiing or for for shipping and commerce, which is all important, but there's much more to it than that. And I think somehow we see it, but we don't feel it enough at least. Um, Sean, I wonder if we could just zoom out a little bit and talk more about the other dimensions of the work that is going on at Nature Society Singapore. Um, are there any projects that the society is working on that would tell us things and perhaps illuminate um, what we previously did not know about our local biodiversity? Yes, uh, I mean, Nature Society, of course, we do great things and my colleagues are amazing, incredible, incredible people, their energy, their dedication, their years and years of commitment, very knowledgeable, um, but we don't have a monopoly on these, but having said that, I think my colleagues have done some pretty um, important things. They've, for example, shown the connectivity of different habitats. So for example, Sungai Bolo, for years, people in Nature Society have said that other, these shorebirds go to Sungai Bolo, but without other marine coastal habitats, we won't see those birds because they feed in one place, they might feed at another place, they might also go to Sungai Bulo. So I think to, I think they they were some of the first to demonstrate that connectivity. The horseshoe crab people are are doing very interesting work and and have inspired others in, in other places, and they collaborate with others in Asia on having a better understanding of these really enigmatic but fascinating fascinating creatures. And I think more broadly, um, one of the programs that my colleagues at Nature Society are doing it's called. Um, it's more a dream really, but it's called Every Singaporean a Naturalist. Imagine if each of us went out, we knew the names of a few trees. We wouldn't have to be forest experts, but we knew a few names of a few trees. We knew about you know the most common birds that we saw in the street every day. Oh, that's an Iora, that's a you know, Sunda woodpecker. Uh, because it, it's part of our environment. And, and to think that you're in this environment and all these things are going by you, wondrous things, but not knowing the names of it. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit, to me, a bit unfortunate, sad thing. And so I think that's some of the things that we try to do, which is study it, find data that can help us better uh, collaborate with, uh, pass that data to government agencies who then can formulate better conservation policy, work with colleagues in other countries to conserve at a, at a, a, a wider range, but also how do we transform our fellow citizens, not to say to turn them into trend conservationists, but just to get people to realize, it's, it's kind of like somebody lifted the veil over your eyes and said, wow, this nature is incredible, amazing. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and like other like-minded organizations and people. Um, Jay Sung is uh, making a comment that in India, there's a really strong connection to um, the river Ganges, but pollution is still rife. Um, and he wonders if um, we have the same conundrum, um, the reflection is that we have resources and we have the possibilities to deepen our coastal heritage, um, but is the problem more deeply rooted to our own cultural um, disregard for nature? Yes, um, thank you. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if for some people there's a disregard and that, that's true, um, but perhaps maybe it, it's more broadly speaking, maybe a, a disconnect. 
it, it, in, in some, you know, it's partly disregard, it's partly neglect, uh, but it's also a disconnect. And, and I think the solution is going to come at multiple levels. So things like, you know, how do you treat uh, a sewage or, or how do you maintain a kind of uh, um, what's solid waste management? That, that's a that's a management as well as a technology kind of problem. There's also a behavioral component to that too, in terms of are we, are we more civic minded, and, you know, and and do we have places where we could put our trash, and so on. So so there's that aspect, sort of the technical and management side. Then of course there would be policy, uh, carrot and stick kind of things, incentives for being a green company, penalties for for those that are not, uh, and then the third part is us, and how can that change come from inside and imagine you know for for many of these people like these sacred rivers as polluted as they are people will still go to them they're they're they're, they're no less sacred they're no less magic and despite the sorry state that some of these beautiful waterways are um they're still very dear to us maybe more places would be like new zealand where where actually a river was given the same rights as a human, as as people, you know. So and that's 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 slowly going to change. And and I and I think um, that combination. I think Singapore is well placed. We've got we've got policy. We've got technology. We've got a uh, waste in management infrastructure. Now let's go after hearts and minds. So that we have five point five million of us who 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 are into it and who who also visit other places, interact with people from around the world. And, and let that let that love for nature spread. I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you and just latch onto the point that you just mentioned. I mean, with the understanding that conservation is such a complex enterprise and there really isn't a silver bullet, um, what do you consider to be some of the most urgent challenges um, that the conservation community here is currently facing? Um, what are some of the issues that you would like to see prioritized? Or perhaps what do you see as some of the current gaps in the conservation space? That's a, a good question. And I think if, if um, you know, I'm happy to say over the, just over the past year, um, despite the, 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 the wreckage of, of, of the pandemic, um, we have seen, despite that, the tightening of environmental impact assessment uh, um, policy in Singapore, I think we've seen a renewed effort to do a lot of marine, marine conservation and the setting aside of, of marine protected areas or certainly marine uh, parks or recreational areas. We're starting to see this and, and I, I'm not saying Singapore's perfect, but I, I think this, I, I think in terms of the physical management of our coasts, we slip up now and then, but I think we do all right. But I think there's this, this gaping, there's this huge um, gaping need and that's, how do we take this uh, high consumption lifestyle and to align it, to bring it to the same level that we're giving to sort of physical protection? You know, so it, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose that we have nice park and it's kept free of litter and we take school kids, you know, to, to look at it. And then at night we, we, we're, we're eating all this endangered stuff, unagi and bluefin tuna, and not in modest amounts, the occasional treat. We're going back day after day you know, and, and we're just one city. The whole rest of the world is, is doing the same thing. That, that's, so in other words, to me, that transformation hasn't been um, complete. It's interesting how the great Sylvia Earle uh, once lamented that on land, we call animals biodiversity. In the ocean, we call that seafood. And so already you can see kind of our bias, but I think it's still possible to have reverence and to be thankful for the ocean that provides us with this bounty. But it's not an endless bounty, we need to manage it properly. On the topic of um, physical management of coasts, um, Michael, I wonders if you think Singapore is playing catch up in the areas of marine conservation after decades of modernization, um, including clearing of vegetation and mangrove swamps. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Yeah, that's a very fascinating point. I think there's a couple of things. Maybe, you know, uh, in Singapore, we, 
we we often take a um, very pragmatic, and that's not a criticism. We need we need to build up industry. We need to provide jobs. We need sort of economic. Uh, uh, we need reserves, cash reserves, which have uh, stood us in good stead this past year. So there's all this need and we don't commit to things until we're sure we can fulfill these commitments. Um, but maybe at the same time, we need good ideas, not just from uh, academics, but from people. Can we have all of this prudent management uh, and, 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 and be conservative in some areas but dare to dream and to put those, to realize those dreams at the same time. Uh, can we, you know, and we, we, thanks to good policy and enforcement, we can have thriving coral reefs and seagrass meadows and some of the world's busiest shipping lanes. But at the same time, yes, maybe we could be a little bit more, um, more imaginative in some areas and that imagination we can't leave just to uh, a, a select group, those ideas, if they come really from everyone and we find a good platform where we can discuss these constructively so that the uh, continued success of places like Singapore can continue hand in hand with enhanced marine uh, protection and nature protection in general, um, fantastic. Let, let's dream, but then let's get realistic and see how can we make that dream come true. Um, that's a related question from Guo Hui. Um, Singapore's public policies have always been economically driven rather than from an altruistic point. Do you think there's a way in which we can make policymakers see the economic value in conservation? Um, case in point, the recent um, clearance of um, the forests that was done um, in era Okay, so I mean, um, yeah, I, 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 I really see, I, I can empathize with that. It's sad to see uh, any nature area cleared. Uh, in defense of the authorities, again, I'm trying to take a um, see both sides of the picture here. The 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 line is, I mean, what what's being said is that that forest developed in the past eight years, which it did, and that forest was meant to be eventually uh, that land was scrub land was meant to be used for agriculture high-tech agriculture or other uh, commercial use which it will be um, but uh, may maybe given the resilience of nature and the vibrancy of it, um, it could could there be a way of continually maybe reevaluating some of these plans and to see is there a way to incorporate more of that nature, whether young or old nature, into this. And maybe, maybe the other thing is this too, you know, there still is this, here's the economy, here's nature. And sometimes nature will have to come at the expense, unfortunately, of the economy. And in many cases, that is true. Um, but maybe, especially with a lot of you in the audience, you know, maybe we can break through this mindset and see, maybe the first question we ask is, um, you know, not this, we have to sacrifice something to gain something else um, uh, worldview, but think, is there possibly a way to achieve both the kind of success that we wish for? And of course, that also depends on what our wishes are, but uh, without coming at the expense of, you know, in, whether it's Singapore or other places, marginalized people, uh, expense of nature, expense of cultural artifacts, and, and so on. And, you know, maybe in some cases, we might be able to achieve that, that um, magic balance between the two, conjure up something um, if we can really harvest the best ideas and the energy that positive energy that comes from people both young and chronologically young and young at heart. Um, continuing the discussion on our woodlands, um, Chai Teh is asking how much has Singapore's natural forests shrunk over the years? And what is your view of having our natural pockets like forests um, being cleared for developments? Thank you. The, um, Many of these um, forests, some of these that have been 
um, in the news lately in Singapore. So this would be crunchy, uh, Dover, uh, Clemente Forest, and so on. These are actually um, young forests that have that uh, recolonized former, say, plantation, abandoned plantation land, or where villages were moved out and, and cleared for eventual development. One, Bukit Brown, was a cemetery that the trees just took over. And so nature's, you know, I used the word exuberant before. Nature really will bounce back. That's, we live in the tropics. Things grow fast. Animals spread seeds. Um, but that's not to say just because an area was once uh, 50 years ago zoned for this particular use and forests come back and you say, okay, well, it's, it's now uh, the day of reckoning has come. And so this area has got to be cleared. We also acknowledge, I think that maybe priorities change, technology changes so that maybe we could maybe build more uh, in a more compact way, move things underground. These these things are already happening. The authorities are planning for some of these things in Singapore. Um, and so as circumstances change, as values change, maybe we won't need the kind of road space that we currently use today. Maybe some of that can be given back for other uses, housing, nature. And, and so I think if the planning maybe was responsive to some of these changes, changes in our uh, updates to technology, updates in our ways of thinking, um, new priorities of a new generation. And I think, you know, without causing sort of chaos at the planning level, and which I think is achievable, um, you know, you get the brightest minds from the agencies, from academia, from the community, put them all in a mix and, and, and some, something incredible could, could come out as a result of it. On a related note, Clement Ng um, observed that there seems to be a conflict between social economic development and environmental issues. Um, urban development has been linked to a suite of environmental problems. Um, so how do scientists and more generally members of public influence local or even regional policymakers to try to adopt more sustainable practices and regulations? Okay, so I think you had a, the previous speaker, very eminent conservation scientist, Professor Coley and Pin, uh, back in January, and so he he has a center called the Center for Nature Based Climate uh, Solutions. Um, so part of it would be maybe to work with nature as part of this overall sort of holistic way of sort of reining in kind of environmental uh, degradation and maybe reversing it to some extent. Some of these will come from technological changes. Some will come from lifestyle changes. So I, I, I think that the science can get us very far in pointing us to ways, things that we could do or need to better manage wilderness, better ways of connecting nature areas for them to be more resilient, better ways of, of propagating and uh, say, uh, distributing uh, rare plants and animals, reintroducing them back into the environment. Much of that comes from policy. I mean, sorry, not policy, from, from the science. Um, so every, I think science has to inform what we do, absolutely. And we need to support that science and encourage more children to, to do it. But I think the science can only get so far. I, I do feel if it's not a concern, you know, we don't, I, I don't think we need to save, well, yes, nature is a buffer against climate change. It cools our cities. It provides food for us. It gives us all these ecosystem services, but I don't want to keep nature because of ecosystem services, yes, it, they, they are important, but I want to keep nature because it's important to us, not just for what it gives to us in a material way, but what it, how it makes us better as a people, how we can uh, respect the legacy our forefathers, our ancestors left us, how we can reconnect. And I think in that reconnection, I think that we can find more value in our own existence and live more meaningful and ultimately set, set, satisfying lives. Um, so I, I, I don't think, I think I veered a little bit, you know, from it, but I, I, I think the science is important, but uh, it's not enough. And policy is important, but that's not enough. 
uh, it, it really will ultimately come down to us. What do we value? How do we communicate to our leaders what's important to us? How do we communicate that, you know, um, economy is important, but so is this natural heritage? And how do we seek solutions? How do we see land not as something just to buy and sell and flip it at a profit, but something that actually from which life uh, comes? So when you build on it, that comes at a very high price. Was it worth pouring concrete over something that could potentially give life? Maybe it is in some cases, but maybe it's not in others. So I, I think it's kind of just a re-examining our, 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 our value system as well. I don't have all the answers, but I think some of many of you do. Speaking about um, trans translating values into action, Sean, one of her ex-students from NIE Kin recently founded um, Singapore Beach Warriors. Um, it's a coastal cleanup group um, to do coastal cleanup in Singapore. And um, Seeking is saying that he, um, the group really wants to save marine life, but um, marine debris is increasing. And he's wondering if you might have any advice for him. You know, Sikin, you know, she, she's not just a former student. She's actually inspiration to, to me and, and to many others. So, yeah, I think uh, uh, student really is master here. I, uh, and Sikin, you're doing amazing things. Uh, very proud to have had the chance to work with you. Um, I think lots of things to do. Of course, you can contribute to the science of, of collect valuable data, which could then go into uh, or um, could translate to better management. I think make important observations. Uh, it's because of people like you uh, the, who, who alert authorities to oil spills, pollution, uh, algal harmful algal blooms, all these kinds of things to be the eyes and the ears uh, on the ground. Uh, uh, the, even end parks as amazing as they are, have a limited uh, capacity. They can't be everywhere every day, uh, all the time. And so groups like the, 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 the Beach Warriors, super important. But, but also I think then using that to have conversations with different people, people in your community, uh, people in science community, take part in citizen science, uh, talking to your uh, leaders, uh, taking people from your town councils to see the, to see the sea, and to cherish it every bit as much as you do. I think it's, um, I think again, it's really about not just climate conversations at the Art Science Museum, but conversations amongst all of us across ethnicities, across age groups, across professions, uh, across countries. I think that's what's gonna get us uh, to that next level where we want to be, where we need to be actually. We, we are seeing that the environment is becoming a unifying issue for youth. And um, that's a really lovely message, Sean, to the young people who are listening in and engaging in the session today. I think we might just have time for two last questions. Um, maybe a broader one, Sean. Um, what is your outlook for conservation over the next um, 10 to 20 years um, in, in the Singapore landscape? I think, uh, I think the outlook is bright. We've got compared to i mean it was compared to 30 years ago when i first came we have so many more people um it, it, in many ways nature has become mainstream it's not a, it's not a fringe uh, the the mainstream is caught up in many ways with the nature society i mean things that we that were considered maybe um um way out there or perhaps even slightly dangerous uh 30 years ago it's just kind of a standard thing for most of us to say nature is important and we need to protect it it's enshrined in policy and in management um and i and so i i and and i see the parks board they have more staff from from three people who did conservation to a whole department that does this is center for biodiversity and and to start, we're sending some of our best young minds to best places locally and overseas to study and then to come back and be managers of nature and researchers. This is really encouraging. Uh, so I think it's bright, but I, I think Singapore and, and well, people everywhere should have bigger ambitions, really. I mean, if you think about what we do locally, I think we're doing a good thing. But if we just focus on our own 
resources and, and not ask, well, how are we impacting either negatively or positively on the marine resources of the whole uh, region? You know, I mean, consider, for example, our voracious appetite for seafood. What can we do to make that industry truly sustainable and that we can play a part in formulating either whether it be policy, take part in the research, public outreach? Um, who knows what we, I think we're only just scratching the surface. So, so in many ways, I, I think we, I'm very optimistic about the domestic conservation scene, but I think we need to think bigger than that because every, everyone is needed and the world needs us. Uh, not to say that uh, we have all the answers, but um, I think we need to, we need to, you know, let's get the boots on the ground and do some stuff that we all benefit. I thought it might be quite lovely to end with this question from Zoe Ong. Um, Zoe's asking, uh, what is your favorite thing about Singapore's ocean? I think, Zoe, uh, um, it, the, the ocean is just this, I'm not sure what to say. It's just this, it's full of magic and wonder. It's this miraculous uh, realm. What strikes me is that we have such busy shipping lanes, there's so much activity, so much has been done, land reclamation, um, so much has been, and is going on around our seas, but yet we still have so much amazing, incredible diversity of coral, of fish, of, of uh, you know, we have rich, teeming, diverse waters, um, and yet, we've shown that it's possible to enjoy this incredible marine heritage and diversity um, at the same time uh, w without compromising the commerce and all these other activities. I think that is, uh, I, I still am, am amazed every time I see the ocean and you see all those ships off the East Coast and you think, well, in those waters um, are, are some of the, richest marine habitats you could find anywhere. I think that's, I, I think that's hats off to everyone who's made that possible and to mother nature, of course, who has this incredible resilience as well. As well. Thank you so much, um, Sean, for making time to take part in climate conversations. Um, walking through the history of conservation biodiversity in Singapore through your presentation, um, sharing so much of the beautiful personal anecdotes and bringing about such a wonderful discussion um, in the concluding chapter um, of this series of talks. We will be continuing to follow the work that Nature Society Singapore is doing with keen interest. And we wish you and the society the very best. Thank you very much, Sin. And again, the team at Art Science Museum and all of you uh, for making this very uh, memorable for me. Um, and also thank you to everyone who has joined us across the five month run of the program. And also to all of you who have been spending your time with us this evening with all your comments and questions. Um, we apologize that we were unable to get through all of them, um, but we would very much love to hear your feedback on the talk today, um, which you can share with us through an online survey by scanning the QR code that's coming onto the right top right hand corner of the screen. Um, we also hope you get a chance to visit Plan Out Plastic Exhibition before it closes on the 25th of April at Art Science Museum. On the Friday of 16th of April at 6 p.m., my colleague Amita Kirpalani is leading the last curator's tour of Planet of Plastic in the galleries. Um, she'll be taking visitors on a visual journey through images, videos, and infographics that tell the story of the marine plastics crisis as seen through the lenses of National Geographic photographers and explorers. And between the 12th and the 31st of March, our education team is also organizing a holiday program of upcycling craft workshops. So please join us for these on-site activities if you're able to. You can stay up to date with everything that's happening at the museum or on our online content platform, Art Science at Home, via our website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. Um, please continue to stay safe and keep well in the meantime, everyone. And we hope to see you soon. And thank you so much again, Dr. Lam. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>